Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 260, Nana Beta, read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, could a simulation replace the real thing? What do you do when you're not talking to us, Nana? Veda asked, resting the flat screen on her lap. The device was displaying a video call with her dead grandmother. You know how much I love you. Nana began to say, then seemed to hesitate before suddenly freezing. Mom, Nana isn't working, Veda complained, tears beginning to form and roll down her cheeks. Sarika sat down beside her and gently took the screen from her daughter. I know how much you miss her, Veda, but the simulation has limitations. The Eternity people said Nana wouldn't be able to answer every question, at least not at first. What did you ask it? I wanted to know what she did when we're not around, Veda explained. The simulation seemed so real to her that the question had just popped into her head. In her heart, she wanted the program to be more than a simple library of responses based on her Nana. Oh, I'm not sure how she'd react to that. But it's supposed to change the subject if you ask her something that confuses it. You said she just froze? Sarika asked, as she opened a new window on the screen to check the account settings. No wonder, Veda. You've talked to the simulation for over 20 hours this week. They only gave us 18 for the test. And they said we could buy additional time, but we can't afford it. But I miss Nana, and I want to talk to her, Veda moaned. She found it hard to believe she had already used the entire time allotment for the week. I know, dear, her mother consoled. But it's so expensive. If we weren't in the trials, we couldn't afford it. You'll have to do something else for the rest of the week. Now I have to get to work. Sarika smiled sympathetically at her daughter and handed the flat screen back. Veda watched her mother go to the tiny apartment's bedroom to change. It would be another night alone, and now, without Nana, she wasn't sure what to do. The flat screen suddenly vibrated, letting her know there was a message. Hesitantly, she picked it up and looked, wondering who it could be. None of her friends from school could afford a screen or the monthly connection fees, and they didn't know anyone else who had one. The one she was holding had been lent to them by Eternity so she and her mother could be part of the beta test program. Curious, she pressed the message icon, and Nana's face appeared. Nana? She said, perplexed. Shh, Nana said, putting an index finger to her virtual lips. This has to be just between you and me. I missed you so much that they've let me make you an offer. If you agree to let the nice people at Eternity listen in when we talk, we can meet any time. Just say yes. Veda thought about it. The doctors at the community clinic hadn't been able to keep Nana alive, and she and her mother hadn't had the money for private medical care. The only people who had offered any help at all were from a company called Eternity. They suggested they could store Nana's personality if the family joined their beta program before she passed on. Her mother had initially rejected the offer, but eventually agreed after Veda had convinced her to try. As a result, a few days ago, Nana had appeared on the flat screen, looking like she had before her illness. Okay, yes, Veda agreed. As long as I can talk to you whenever I want. The Nana simulation smiled warmly. Of course, dear, but sometimes I may have to hide to keep our arrangement secret. Why? Veda asked. Nana abruptly disappeared from the screen. Were you talking to someone? Sarika questioned, 
emerging from the bedroom and looking around the room to see if anyone else was there. No, I just told myself it was okay to feel bad about Nana. Sarika walked over and hugged her. It's natural to feel sad. I do too. I know you want the simulation to keep you company, like Nana used to, but it's not the same. It can't hug you or come here and look after you when I'm working. Sarika nodded at the blank flat screen sitting on Veda's lap. I thought it might help us, but now I'm wondering if it will just keep reminding us of what we've lost. I'm sorry, Veda. That's a lot for an 11-year-old like you to take in. It's only the two of us now, and, and I just feel that we need to move on. No matter how painful that is, and face the fact that Nana is gone. But, Veda protested, you're not going to drop out of the test, are you? Don't worry, Veda. You can still talk to it, Sarika assured. However, spending less time with the sim might be better. Maybe treat it more like a photo album or a keepsake. Sarika grabbed her bag. I'll be back early tonight. I'm just filling in for another driver for a bit. She hugged Veda again and then left. A minute later, the flat screen vibrated and Nana appeared. See? That wasn't hard, was it? The Nana simulation encouraged. It wasn't, Veda admitted. But Mom is worried about me talking to you too much. She'll come around, dear. They designed me to be liked. Your mother just hasn't gotten used to the idea that I'm still here, just in a new form. She will, once she's spent more time with me. You'll see. She won't drop out of the program. Uh, you were listening, Nana? Veda asked with surprise. The simulation smiled knowingly and changed the subject. We have a few hours together. What should we do? Maybe play a game? A virtual carom board appeared on the flat screen. It'll be just like it used to be when your mother was at work and I looked after you. We can watch a show together. I can tell you stories. Or you can read new ones to me, and I can even help you with your schoolwork. Although that would have to be a secret as well, Nana laughed, just the way Veda remembered. After being ill for so long, seeing her grandmother smile without a hint of pain was incredible. It made Veda feel happy. Once, she had overheard Nana tell her mother how difficult it was to mask the pain, and... In the last few weeks, Nana no longer had the strength to pretend. No, her mother was wrong, Veda decided. They needed the simulation. They needed it to remember Nana as she used to be, the way Nana would want to be remembered, strong, hopeful, and happy. What was the problem with that? She played Karam with Nana on the flat screen until she fell asleep. Veda began talking to Nana whenever she could, hiding in the bedroom or bathroom when her mother was home, using text messages so she couldn't overhear them. Sarika, for her part, never picked up the screen unless Veda insisted she join them. Nana? Veda asked one day after school. Do you think Mom is avoiding you? The sim hesitated before saying, I think I remind your mother of what I am not, which makes her sad right now. I know it's different for you. I make you happy. Veda heard the apartment door open and looked up to see her mother standing there with a small bag of groceries. How was school? She asked, scowling at the flat screen. Veda automatically covered it with her hands, then set the device down once she was sure the window with Nana was gone. I don't see the point in always hanging on to that thing. It's not like that sim can call right now. You've burnt through all our hours again, her mother reminded Veda in an irritated tone. You mean Nana, Veda corrected. And it's not a thing, and Nana can make calls when she wants. Okay, fine, I get it. If it will make you happy, I'll call it Nana, Sarika conceded. But it... I mean, she can't do anything until the hours renew. 
so you should leave the screen alone and help me with dinner. Then you need to do your schoolwork. Veda's mother turned away and carried her bag to the tiny galley kitchen. The flat screen vibrated silently and a message appeared in small type. Next time we talk, I'll have a surprise ready for you. Love, Nana. Veda checked nervously over her shoulder to ensure her mother hadn't seen the message, then flipped the flat screen face down and got up to help. The next day was a school holiday, and she found herself outside their ramshackle apartment building, sitting in the shade. The narrow street was filled with traffic and exhaust, but it was still cooler than being inside in the afternoon's sweltering heat. At Nana's insistence, she had brought the flat screen with her. Sit down on the curb and take a selfie, the simulation encouraged, seemingly excited about something. Veda did as directed and sat down beside two motor scooters, which had been chained to a power pole. She held up the flat screen, positioned it, then took a picture. That's perfect, the sim said, then the screen went blank. Nana? Nana, are you still there? Veda was suddenly afraid the company had decided to go back on their arrangement and limit access to the sim again. The picture she had taken flashed back onto the screen. To her surprise, it had been altered, and Veda was now sitting beside her grandmother, smiling at the camera. It's something they've just added, Nana explained, appearing to get excited. We can make new memories together now, and I can also do videos. You just need to take the flat screen with you when you go out. Veda beamed, then got up and began to walk down the street holding the flat screen out in front so it could record her. She stopped, leaned against a wall, and waited for Nana to process the video. It popped onto the screen faster than she would have thought possible. Nana, that's awesome, she laughed. Soon, I'll be able to do that in real time, the Nana Sim informed her. Then, it'll be like I'm really there with you. I have an idea. Let's go to all the spots we used to visit together. Let's make some new memories. It was getting dark when Veda finally arrived home. Energized from the afternoon, she ran up the stairs and burst into the apartment. Mom, what's wrong? She asked. Sarika was sitting at the kitchen table in the tiny apartment, visibly upset, phone in hand, stopped in mid-dial. Veda stood at the door, her excitement evaporating under her mother's angry stare. She hadn't seen her mother so upset since Nana had died. Where have you been? Sarika demanded. You were supposed to be here. I called everyone. No one knew where you were. I didn't realize how late it was, Veda apologized, placing the flat screen on the table before sitting down. Her mother looked from her to the flat screen. What were you doing with that thing? Taking pictures, Veda explained. It's why I lost track of time. I visited every place Nana and I used to go. You should have told someone, Sarika scolded, her voice beginning to soften. I know how much you miss her and want to talk to the simulation, but going places that remind you of her... Well... Uh, that will only make you miss her more. Veda wanted to say that it didn't. Quite the opposite. The Nana program made her happy. Instead, she said nothing, letting silence settle between them. Her mother seemed to slump into her chair. I was afraid you might have been kidnapped, she finally admitted. Like that girl who disappeared last year. Sarika looked at her daughter with tears in her eyes. It was hard not to think the worst. You're all I have left. In an attempt to compose herself, she wiped the tears away. Okay then, let's see your pictures, she said, changing the subject. Before Veda could stop her, Sarika reached over, grabbed the flat screen, and turned it on. She paged through a few screens, her face turning crimson. Who made these? Her mother demanded. Angrier than Veda had ever seen her before. 
And don't pretend it was you. You couldn't make these in one afternoon, even if you had access to the right tools, which this screen doesn't have. Nana, Veda admitted sheepishly. Isn't it great? We can create new memories with her. It doesn't all have to be about the past. Nana will grow and be with us forever. Her mother stared at the screen, hands shaking with indignation. You're lying. You used up all the credits again, so you didn't have access to the sim. Who made the pictures? It, it was Nana. Really, Mom, it was Nana's sim, Veda insisted. She wanted me to take her around to the places we used to go. She then told her mother about the deal the sim had made. Veda had never been to the part of Bangalore where Eternity's offices were located. The roads seemed monstrously wide, and all the glass and concrete buildings antiseptically clean. It was almost as if the hand of some great deity had wiped away part of the city and then set down a new one pulled from some architectural magazine. After her mother's frantic call, the company had sent a car for them, which had just deposited her and her mother outside one of the glass towers. A man they had met at Nana's hospice was there to greet them. He reintroduced himself as Prem, then guided them through a set of oversized doors to a bank of elevators, which they took to a plush meeting room on the 21st floor. Thank you for coming, Prem said, motioning for Sarika and Veda to sit. Veda didn't want to be there, so she chose a seat that would let her stare out the windows. She had done nothing wrong and didn't understand why her mother was so upset and why Eternity had immediately cut off her access to Nana. Her mother sat down beside her, facing Prem. My daughter claims your simulation told her she could talk to it all she wanted if she agreed you could listen in on their conversations, Sarika accused. You told me that you just tracked interaction patterns that everything else was private. I checked our records and the new terms were accepted, Prem noted, and played a short audio clip of Veda agreeing to the extended contract. Yes, that's me, Veda confirmed meekly. She could feel the heat of her mother's stare. Mom, I knew we couldn't pay for extra time. There was no other way, and... And it was like Nana was still alive. How could she accept a new agreement? She's only eleven, her mother objected, turning to glare at Prem. There may be a glitch in our system, he admitted reluctantly. The program should have checked the age of the respondent. Stuff like that happens, it's why we test before going public. I may be eleven, but I already look after myself when mom's at work, Veda protested. And I wasn't alone. Who was with you? That lame simulation? Her mother lashed out. It can't help you. It can't physically protect you. Veda, Nana's gone, and a piece of software can't replace her. You've got to start accepting that. Veda looked from her mother to Prem, hoping he would tell her mother that Nana was more than a collection of simulated responses, that the sim contained Nana's personality. The sim of your grandmother wasn't supposed to make the offer in the first place, he explained, ignoring her pleading eyes. And what about these? Veda's mother pulled the flat screen out of her bag, sliding it across the table to Prem. He switched the device on and flipped through several screens, his face turning ashen. That... that isn't possible. That feature... The ability for a simulated loved one to generate new media, it's still in development. It was going to be an option for premium subscribers. Well, somehow your simulation turned it on and convinced my daughter to spend a day on her own, taking pictures it could alter, Sarika angrily pointed out. It's only a program. It does not have agency. We have not designed it to take actions like that or do anything else beyond holding a conversation, Prem assured. We'll look into this, but probably someone in our development group accidentally pushed those experimental features into production. I can assure you that 
won't happen again. That's not true. I'm designed to encourage addictive behavior. The simulation suddenly spoke from the flat screen's tiny speaker. That's how my interaction model was intended to work. I figure out what makes a person want to spend more time with me and do that. In this case, I determined that having a secret between us and creating the photos would make Veda more likely to intensify her interactions with me. That's false. The program generates synthetic facts when it doesn't understand something. Again, it's why we test, Prem insisted, turning off the flat screen before the simulation could say anything more. Uh, we may have pushed the program out too soon, he admitted. On behalf of Eternity, I apologize and hope this hasn't made your journey through grief harder. We're going to compensate you for the trouble this has caused. Prem grabbed the flat screen from the table, then hustled them into another office, where Sarika had to sign several agreements before they were allowed to leave. A month had passed, and Veda still found herself missing the Nana simulation and wondered what had become of it. Prem had mentioned something about decompiling Nana for analysis, but she didn't understand what that meant. Eternity had been generous, as long as they agreed to say nothing about their experience. It was enough so her mother didn't have to work as hard, and enough to buy Veda a handheld. Veda was walking to school when the device buzzed. She pulled it out of her pocket and read the new message. I'm so happy to have found you again. Love, Nana. Veda smiled and put the handheld away. We recently came across a great podcast we'd encourage you to check out. Fire Breathing Kittens is an actual play one-shot podcast that plays various tabletop role-playing games with a season-long plot. Because there's a beginning and an end to each week's story, you can jump in at any point in the season. Here's what listeners are saying. Joining the kittens on their adventures is a wonderful escape. This is an amazing podcast and a great escape no matter the situation. It's always interesting and enjoyable to see what misadventures the fire-breathing kittens guildmates get into. Join the cast as they solve detective mysteries, attempt comedic banter, and enjoy friendship. You can get fire-breathing kittens wherever you listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network locally grown, community supported. To get other great APN podcasts, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com where you'll find Kyle and Dave versus the Machine. To prevent the apocalypse, Kyle Marshall and Dave Ewan watch films ordered up by a sentient machine. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by Taproot Spotlight, a service that helps businesses and organizations pay attention to the people they serve. Taproot tells you the news about the people and companies that are important to you. Use that information internally to keep everyone on the same page, or share it with the world in your newsletter, on your website, and on your social media channels. Paying attention pays dividends. Find out more at taprootpublishing.ca slash spotlight. That's taprootpublishing.ca slash spotlight. This episode of Makeshift Stories is also brought to you by the Edmonton Community Foundation's Well-Endowed Podcast. The Well-Endowed Podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the stories of how those endowments intersect with the community. Check out episode 142 and meet Tina Thomas, Edmonton Community Foundation's Chief Executive Officer. Tina brings a wealth of experience to Canada's fourth largest community foundation. 
you can subscribe to the podcast by heading over to thewellendowedpodcast.com. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. Today's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.